last testimony, and of course that's Second Timothy, they tell us, at least uh, in, through the history of our Word of God, that that's the last book that Paul wrote as he's ready to be offered in uh, Second Timothy. And he leaves specific instructions for those. And in extension, he gives it to Timothy, but in extension, he gives it to us. And it's called the faith, which is a definite article. So what, we're, what I titled, uh, <laughs> titled this lesson day is, we're saved to serve. That faith, which is that good thing that Paul talks about, that precious deposit that he was given by Christ. And now he's leaving it to Timothy and he's leaving it to Titus. And he tells us three things that he is and that we should, we should be a good soldier. We should, we're running a race. And what emphasizes that, Paul talks about running a race. He doesn't talk necessarily about winning that race. He just says that as long as we're here, and it says we are running that race for the faith. That's our responsibility. And he doesn't even say the Lord will decide how well we've all run that race. We won't decide that. The Lord will decide that. And also then we're to do it as a faithful steward, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. So in light of that, let's look at that passage now. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And notice the things he tells Timothy. And he, t he warns them and also tells them. We're going to start with the first verse. First of all, he says, I charge thee. So that's very specific when you say someone to some, I'm charging you with this, okay? Tracy is in charge of a lot of people, I understand, at the airport. I don't know, but there's many. I don't, I've never been to that airport. But I'm sure that he has charged different people under him with things to do, if that's true, right, Tracy? You give them a responsibility, and you expect them to what? Get it done, don't you? I just show up every day. Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, so anyways, it's a, he had charged them, therefore, before God, he's telling him, and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. And the kingdom of God is a general term. It's used in both dispensations. The dispensation that's been given to Peter in the 12, and our dispensation is given to him. Now he tells them specifically what he's charging them to do. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering, and that last thing, doctrine. And I said 21 times doctrine is mentioned in, in Paul's epistles, and 16 of those times were in 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus as Paul leaves. That's how important doctrine is. The, uh, to, to most today that want to get it together with the ecumenical movement, they look at it and say, well, that's not that important. Let's do the things we agree in. So, but no, Paul emphasizes that the doctrine and has to do with the faith, that good thing, that precious deposit that was given to him. So when we look at that, he says, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, rebuke, rebuke exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And then he gives a warning in the next verse. He says, for the time will come when they're not going to endure, what? Sound doctrine. But after their own lust, they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, that's the faith, that precious deposit that Paul was given, and shall be turned into fables. There's that thing that a lot of people talk about that we should be going back to Pentecost. You'll hear that with a lot of things. No, we do not want to go back to Pentecost. We want to go forward with Paul and his doctrine. That's why they, talk, they say, well, Paul seems to be such a braggart. Well, what he's bragging about is his commission. He's, he's bragging about the gospel that was given to him, not about himself as a person. You know, he says very carefully, you know, it actually, I think, really got to Paul that he had persecuted that church, the, the kingdom church, the, that's going to be on the earth, given to Israel. 
And so very quickly he says, I'm not even worthy to be an apostle, but I have a job to do. So he says, they're going to turn away their ears from the truth, shall be turned to him, but watch thou in all things. And then he tells Timothy two words there. What does he tell him? Endure afflictions. Now, when Paul was having a thorn in the flesh, and Paul asked three times for it to be taken away, do you remember what Christ said to him? Is made perfect in what? What's the last word? Weakness. Not in, as we will get, not in prosperity, as we have this prosperity too, but it's made perfect in weakness. So now Paul changed his whole attitude. That thorn in the flesh did not leave him, but his attitude changes. Very clear. And he says, I'm going to take pleasure now in my afflictions and my persecutions, everything. That's a hard thing to do, but that's where Paul had to get mentally to understand. So very clearly here, Paul, uh, he tells Timothy, you're going to have to endure afflictions. Do the work of an adventure, make full proof of the ministry. For now I am ready to be offered. And that's an interesting word there. Now, go, hold on to there and go back to Philippians. And it's a little different than what he says in Philippians, this offering. And this was, I wondered why that word is used. Well, you see in Philippians in chapter 2, and um, I apologize because I'm trying to find the verse in 2 when Paul says it's much more if somebody can help me, I'll appreciate it. I think it's in chapter 2 when he talks about that it's, he said, uh, it'd be much better for me if I would depart, but it's much better for you that I stay. And I do apologize for you, but I can't think. But anyways, you'll get the idea. I think it's in Philippians chapter 2. Huh. Or maybe it's in, no, it's in chapter 1. That's why I can't find it. Okay. So let's go back. Uh, verse 21, I found it. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I wot not. For I am in a strait betwixt two, or we would say between two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. He means for him individually, it would be much better for what I'm going through. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more meaningful for you. So he says, he gives a contrast there of what would be better for him, but what is better for the Philippians if he stays. But now Paul has finished his course. He finished the course that he said in Acts 20 or 24, I've been given the gospel of the grace of God by Christ. And he says, because I have something to finish. But here he says, I have finished my course. And in Acts chapter 20, it's because I've been given this, I have a course to finish. Now, in light of that, so, but he says, an offering. And I thought about that, of what Paul could be talking about. I am ready to be offered. He just doesn't say I'm ready to die. Well, I was thinking, do you remember what the drink offerings were that Israel would give? It was always in what? In Thanksgiving, wasn't it? When they gave offerings for Thanksgiving. So I'm just giving you, please, my interpretation that Paul says, I'm being offered in thanksgiving to God. I think that's what Paul is saying here. It's more than just departing. Because I am so thankful for this wonderful commission I've been given and to understand the grace of God. That you and I are justified freely by God's grace through the redemption of Christ. That this wonderful free gift that God's not given only a gift to Paul to give to others, has been given to us. And that's an unbelievable thing. So he said, I'm doing this. I'm ready to be offered in thanksgiving, no matter how bad it is. And what, he's going to be executed by the sword. I can't comprehend that, that you're going to just, they're going to just lay him down, and somebody's going to have a long sword, and whoo, 
and over. So anyways, when I look at that, and he says, the time and I had a part of but then he says three things here, and we've looked at this before. He says, I have fought that good fight. So he was a good soldier. So when he goes back, and I'll go back to chapter 2 of Second Timothy, Paul's not just saying to Timothy, well, I may not have done it, but I want you to be a good soldier. What he's saying to Timothy is, I want you to remember I'm your pattern, and he's saying things to you, and I was a good soldier. I fought the good fight for the faith. And what do we learn about the faith? Paul takes that word, the faith, that definite article, and he emphasizes that in the last part of every one of 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. So let's review a bit. Go back to 1 Timothy chapter 6 and look at the last verse, 21. We looked at this last week. Actually, I should start in 20 because he's saying, O Timothy, Keep that which is committed to thy trust. That's the good thing that Paul gave to, to uh, that leads with Timothy. Avoiding profane and vain babbling, so he gives a warning there, and oppositions of science falsely so called. Which some professing, so if some professing, it would be some that even have understood this grace message, have erred concerning what? The faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. Paul always leaves us with that wonderful thing. So now in 2 Timothy, Paul says the same thing when he talks about I fought a good fight. So look at 2 Timothy chapter 4 and look at verse 7. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. And I have what? The faith. And that one faith is the one, the, the faith is the one faith of Ephesians 4, the seven ones, and why we do not have unity, because people don't see the one faith, or that faith that was given in special revelation to Paul, and the one baptism, of course, that we talk about that has nothing to do with water, has to do that the moment you put your faith in the completed work of Christ at Calvary, and what he's done for you at that time, you have been baptized by the Holy Spirit, has nothing to do with water, and identified and placed into the body of Christ. That's the job that the Holy Spirit does. He's the author of the Word of God. But he specifically, he places us, seals us in unto the day of redemption, something we cannot lose. It's all because of what Christ has accomplished for us. So he said, there the faith now, and so in Second Timothy he said, I fought a good fight, I finished my course, I've kept the faith. Now when you go to Titus, the last verse that he gives to Titus, he emphasizes that again, the faith. In chapter 3 and verse 15, all that are with me salute thee. Greet them that love us where? In the faith. So I want you, uh, you to greet them in the faith, that Special deposit given to Paul, and he ends it with again, grace be with you, amen. So very clearly you can see how important that is, but he doesn't leave Timothy. So go back then to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, and he tells uh, Timothy something very important, verses 1 through 3. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, number one. And the things that thou have heard of me, too. And remember, he emphasized that because back in chapter 1, look at verse 13, he says the same thing. Timothy, hold fast the form of sound words which you have heard of me. So he twice tells Timothy how important it is. And who did we use as an example of that under the law? We went back to Joshua. And God emphasized that to him twice Joshua, I want you to be strong and bold. I want you to have courage. And the, uh, the Lord didn't say it to him. Moses had already told him that back in Deuteronomy, but now in there, he, uh, the Lord says it to Joshua twice to emphasize it. Paul is doing the same thing to Timothy. If you want to emphasize something, I know as a teacher, then you repeat yourself, not just once, but twice so the students can get it. So when we're studying God's word, you'll see the emphasis. Now, let's continue. And the things, verse 2 of chapter 2, heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men. Now he gives them a commission. I don't want you to just be faithful, Timothy. 
I want you to get a faithful man. And as we knew, something happened where for thousands of years that was not true. And how it got so bad that the world went into what we call the Dark Ages in the 12th and 13th century. And it was controlled by a church. I don't even have to remember what that church was. But we came out of that not just to see a little bit of light when Martin Luther saw a little bit about faith, but it also had the secular world maybe actually have to be able to get through the dark ages and get out of that and come from the darkness into the light. And it changed even the progress in the secular world because of that wonderful thing. But the problem is people didn't, get, didn't continue to see the growth of the little bit of light that, that Martin Luther saw to see that. And of course, then the Protestant denominations got totally confused again in that denomination. But anyways, let's continue now. Who shall be able to teach others? But here's the key. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier. Timothy, I have been a good soldier. I want you to be a good soldier. And then I want you to commit this to faithful men who will also be a good soldier. Now, why this is important is that Paul not only says it, he did it. And that's what I want to emphasize today. So I want you to go back to the book of Acts and to see how Paul was a good soldier and endured hardness as a good soldier, no matter how bad it got for him. And there's an interesting verse in chapter 14. And I'm going to do something opposite of what we usually do. We usually start and give you the ending of how important it is. I'm going to give you the ending and then to sort of question you, why is, that, why is this verse so important? So in Acts chapter 14, I want you to look at just one verse there, verse 21. Now he's leaving, he's in Derby here. And, he's, and he says, and when they had preached the gospel in that city, in the verse before, so it's in Derby, and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch. Hmm. Well, again, you say, well, okay, what a big deal. Okay, you and I went on vacation, we went to somewhere, now we're returning back to Altoona. For me, we're returning back to that glorious city of Johnstown. Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> God's city, okay, okay. I'm blaspheming, I apologize. What? Okay, you're right. <laughs> I agree with you. <laughs> so, yeah, you're right. <laughs> so anyways, you say, well, okay, Galen, what's the big deal about that? So that's the ending of that. But let's look what the big deal about that is, of Paul being boldness. Remember how I... I took you back to Galatians where he says, I want you to pray for one thing for me. What did he say he wanted the people to pray for him for? Boldness. Not for prosperity. Not that I might get a few luxuries on this earth. Or that they would not go, come after me as they were. Not only the Jews, but the Gentiles who hated this message. Paul's just said, but now why is this so significant? This is amazing to me when, uh, as I was putting this together. Well, let's go back and see why this is amazing. So I want you to go back to chapter 13, and we'll go back to when he's in Antioch. So why this is so significant is because in Antioch, and we're going to look at verse 50 here, please. But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the priest men, uh, chief men of the cities and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them what? So you're going to go back there, Paul? <laughs> I'll be truthful. I think the Lord, send me some, to some new places. Don't, be, don't send me back to some place that I've been expelled from when I'm, I can't imagine what's going to be awaiting me. I'm sure a lot of sufferings, a lot of beatings, and maybe a lot of death, but that's what he says. So remember the three cities. The other two were Icon Iconium, if I'm pronouncing this correct, and Lystra. So let's go to the verse, uh, first verse of chapter 14 of Acts. And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews, and so spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also the Greeks, believed. That's amazing. 
So many did believe, not just Jews, but Greeks. It's also interesting of something Paul did in the book of Acts that he never does after the book of Acts. As we said last week, three times he says, I'll turn to the Gentiles, I'll turn to the Gentiles. And as Tracy said, three strikes and you're out in the end of Acts. But here at this time, every time he goes into the city, the first place he goes to in Acts is into a synagogue. He's going to preach to them Christ as their Messiah to the Jews, or to this new message also, Jews and Greek. But here, but now notice what immediately happens. Verse 2, but the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil afflicted against the brethren. Long time therefore abode they speaking, here's that word, boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Signs and wonders are still going to be there even with Paul in the book of Acts, but not afterwards. But the multitude of the city now was divided, and part held with the Jews and part with the apostles. And when there was an assault made both of the Gentiles and also the Jews with their rulers to use them despitefully and to what? He's going to go back to Iconium <laughs> after he preached in Derby. They want to stone him there in Iconium. But notice the next verse. The Lord does help him in the book of Acts. They were aware of it and fled into Lystra and Derby cities and go on into the region. And there they preach the gospel. Now, verse 8 is also very significant. And there's one reason why I'm going to give you an account that took place. Because even though they had stirred things, Paul's going to perform a miracle. And when he performs this miracle, they are going to think that he and Barnabas are gods, small g. Okay? And they called Barnabas, if you know, Jupiter, and they called Paul Mercurius because he was the chief speaker. But now, what's significant about this that I said was very important in the book of Acts, and we did a study of this a long time ago that I took you to, that Paul duplicated every miracle that Peter did. And that was very significant. So if you want to study the book of Acts, look at all the miracles that Paul, that Peter performed, and you'll see that Paul duplicated every single one. And it was necessary to prove his apostleship. That's why Paul was given these signs and miracles. They would have never believed Paul if he did not have that same power. But eight is significant. Look at that. And there said a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked. Now, this is the first miracle we see that Paul performed. Why is it, do you think, why is that so significant? Well, if you want to put a note down, if you do what I have to do, because I'm not able to remember everything. I remember Tracy looking at my Bible one time and he said, Looks like you're adding to the word of God there, Galen, with all your different notes. But I'm not, <laughs> I'm not smart enough, so notes do help me. So in my Bible, I wrote Acts 3, verses 6 through 9, uh, there, verse 8. And when you go back to Acts 3, 6, 9, you'll see Acts 14, 8. Why this is significant is because, do you remember Paul, Peter's first miracle? What? who was what, from birth, had never walked. This is not just by chance. And I think Tracy will agree with you, or all of you will agree. This is absolutely important. That Paul performs the same miracle because, well, what the heck? Let's go back to Acts 3. We're not going to get very far today, so we'll continue next week. And look at verses 6 through 9 in chapter 3 and six through nine, you have this lame man, and all he was doing at the gate was that he wanted alms, he wanted money. He didn't want to be healed. All he wanted was money, and he would be there every day. And now let's start in six. Then Peter said, now he's talking to this man, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leaped, he leaping up stood and walked and entered, in, entered with him into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. This is an actual physical occurrence, but it also gives us what Israel should be like. 
Israel is that lame individual here when Peter and then comes to him that can't walk. But when they come to Christ, when that comes, they're going to be leaping, enjoying, and going into the temple. So it gives us also significant. But what I'm saying is, that's the first miracle that Peter performed. Peter and Paul does the same thing. Later on, Paul's going to raise somebody from the dead. Peter raised from, from the dead. P Peter took away unclean spirits. Paul, if you go to Acts 27, and took away evil spirits. Peter, it says that the thousands came to him in the first part of Acts, and they were all healed. And if you go to Paul in the last part of Acts, he was on an island. And after he had healed a certain man, it said that everyone in the island came to him, and what happened? The same thing. All of them were healed. So it's very significant of how important it is in the book of Acts as we get this transition from Peter to Paul. And remember also I told you, after Acts 15, and Acts 15 is the same council that takes place in Galatians chapter 2, when Paul was sent up by revelation to give them that gospel that was given to him by Christ, to present that to the twelve and to them. And I lost my train of thought, so please forgive me. All of a sudden it just went blank. Yes, thank you. So the important thing that I hopefully was trying to say there, if I can get my thoughts corrected, and I apologize for being old, but hmm, I can't think of what the connection was. I hope I do when I go. But the important thing to see is Paul had to duplicate everything. But when he went to that conference there at that time, What's amazing, as I said to you last week, the three things that Peter and the Eleven were supposed to do, go to all nations, in Matthew 20, go to the whole world, and to every, living, uh, every creature, which is Mark 14, that. Paul fulfilled every one of those. He went to all nations. He went to the entire world. Whether it was the known world, I don't think I'm going to go by the word of God. It said it was revealed. And to every creature. Paul fulfilled in his ministry of grace what Peter and them never fulfilled. And why I said that, but now I know why I went there. Because you have a church out there that says Peter went to Rome. And then he was supposedly crucified upside down. There's no proof of that in the word of God. I don't think that's true. But that he set up this place, which is now they call the eternal city, Vatican. But... Peter then would have lied to Paul, but not only to Paul, but he would have lied to God because he very clearly gave Paul and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, telling them that they would go unto the uncircumcision, the Gentiles, and we will go only to the circumcision. We will minister only to Israel, to those circumcised saints who are part of that earthly kingdom that Peter and them preached. So he would have not only lied because he gave the right hand of fellowship that they would not do that. Also, if you go to the last book of Rome, which is amazing, Paul wrote the book of Romans, according to what I read from history, probably about 62 or 63 A.D., which was like 30 years after Christ was crucified and was resurrected. And why that's significant is because Paul greets in that last chapter I read, I think it's 26 to 29 people that he greets and says salute, and also to their whole household. He's writing to the Romans. He's not there yet. There seems to be one person missing there that he doesn't greet, and that's Peter. So it's always amazed to me. I don't know if Peter's even living 30 years from now, but the important thing, he doesn't greet him. If he would be in Rome, and when Paul's in prison there, as Philippians talk, it doesn't say anything about Peter coming to Paul or Paul asking to have Peter come to him. And some did come to him and minister to him. Just significant. So the word of God is totally different from tradition. We go by the word of God. So there's no proof. It's even, there's out there that some say that, that James, before he died in Acts 12, went to Spain. It's Paul in Romans that says, I'm going to go to Spain. James never went to Spain before he was uh, uh, killed by Herod in Acts 12. But that church has that thing that not only James went there, but then they have someone else that they love so much go with him. They said Mary went with him to Spain, and that's an untruth. So 
So when you look at God's word, always remember that. But anyways, you see what happens here. So they want to stone him in Iconium. And notice what happens here. When they want to stone him, they became aware of it, and they left that region. So now Paul is going back to Antioch, where they expelled him and probably wanted to stone him. Paul is going to go back as a good soldier to Iconium when they definitely want to stone him there. But now he's going back to Lystra. And what's significant about that? Did they also not only want to stone him, they what? They did stone him. And there's a discrepancy. I don't know how you guys look at whether Paul was actually dead or whether he wasn't. I think it's that same time when Paul says, I don't know if I was in the body or out of the body. When I was taken up to the third heaven, I think that's the occurrence here that takes place in Acts 4. But they actually don't do stone him. And they stirred up the people. And But what is so significant is that unbelievable change. Just a few verses before, they were calling them what? Gods. Small g. And they wanted him almost to bow with down. And Paul saying, we're nothing but men. Don't bow down to us. But all of a sudden that changed when they stirred up all this thing. Look at verse 14 of chapter 14, which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard, they rent their clothes and ran them on with crying them. They said, please, we're not gods. We're only men like you. And saying, sirs, why do, you, uh, do, uh, why do ye these things? We also men of like passion with you and preach unto you that ye should turn from these vanities all these other small gods, unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that were in, who in time past suffered all nations to walk in their own way. I think he's talking about back in Genesis 11 before he called out Abraham. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witnesses, in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these things, scarce restrained they the people, that they had not done sacrifices unto him. But now look what happens there. Followed Paul all over, Jews who wanted to kill him. Look at 19. And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium, who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. So what's significant? Why I took you to that last verse is Paul didn't just say to Timothy, well, maybe I wasn't a good soldier, but I want you to be. Paul, as our pattern, proved it just in his small little packages what a good soldier he was. Because I can't imagine that after he had preached in Derby, that he's going to go back to Antioch, where they expelled him, back to Iconium, where they wanted to stone him, and back to Lystra, where they did stone him. That's a good soldier. That's a faithful steward. That's one who's running the race. So he not only says that to Timothy, but notice what he says to the Philippians as we start to close. And boy, I didn't get hardly anywhere, but we'll continue. We're not rushed. In chapter 1 of, of, of uh, Philippians, and notice what he says to them in verse 27. Of chapter 1. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that ye stand fast. That's what he told you, in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries. If you're not terrified, are you a good soldier? Absolutely. Are you keeping the faith? Are you keeping the race? Absolutely. Which is to them an evidence, a token of perdition, but to you of, I love this, of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe him, but what? Also to suffer for his sake. So very clearly he's telling the Philippians exactly what he tells Timothy. So in closing, Paul in, in uh, Philippians chapter 3, that's why Paul ran a race. He doesn't say you're going to win it. He just says continue to run that race as long as we're here. And Paul 
did that at the end of his, uh, uh, in his ministry. So as we close, look at Philippians chapter 3 and look at verse 12, 13 and 14. And this is running that race. This is being a faithful steward. This is being a good soldier. And Paul was that. Let's look at that. Brethren, I count, my, uh, I count not myself to have apprehended. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That's running the race. Paul doesn't say anything about winning it. He says, continue for you and I and all of us here, no matter how small we are. I pass the church every morning when I come here that is very charismatic. And at a quarter to nine, there's already 80 to 100 uh, cars in that lot. But they don't have the message. It doesn't matter what they're doing. It's, we have to understand God's word rightly divided. That wonderful revelation given to Paul. It was given to Paul and only to Paul. And if there's anybody out there as we close, all you have to do as Paul says, put your faith today in what Christ accomplished for you at Calvary. You're justified freely by God's grace through the redemption in Christ Jesus. Believe that verse and you have eternal life in Christ. Father, we just thank you and praise you for this precious word. Help us to be that good soldier, to stand for that faith, to, be, to run that race as long as we're here and to never depart from that and be that faithful steward who's going to keep that good thing that was given to Timothy, who was to give to other faithful men who were to teach others. We just thank you and praise you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you.